friends, welcome to worship for Sunday, September 3rd, 2023, the 14th Sunday of Pentecost and Labor Day weekend. Before anything else, I want to remind you that Cecil's worship time has gone back to 4 p.m. for the school year until Memorial Day. The Shano County Fair is in full swing. The early mornings are crisp, well, until this weekend when we're getting a blast of heat again, and the leaves are turning. The kids are back to school or will be very soon, and our thoughts turn towards apples and football and sweaters. And in the parish, we turn towards our coming fall fundraisers. Black Creek's new fall family festival is Sunday, October 1st. Sign up lists are at church and attach to the materials by email. The Trinity Fall Bazaar on Saturday, October 14th. Sign up lists at church and next week with these materials and Cecil's Fall Soup Sale on Sunday, November 12th, with lots of information in the coming weeks. Our food pantry focus for this month, for all of our area pantries, Cecil, Black Creek, and Navarino, is hamburger helper. Any flavor is good, but cheeseburger and lasagna are very popular. All of them help our families stretch their resources and better provide nourishing meals. And remember, you can always send along a monetary donation with food pantry in the memo line. As it is the first Sunday of the month, communion is included in this service. So I invite you to gather some elements, some bread and cup together before we begin. So you're ready when we get to that part of worship. Remember the specific elements aren't particularly important, but it's the spirit you bring to the meal, the celebration of God's incredible grace that transforms them into a sacrament for us. We continue to pray for Hawaii and receive a special offering for them through the month of September. We pray for Florida as Hurricane Idalia made landfall this week, bringing strong winds and huge tidal surges. In Asia, Typhoon Saola is causing widespread damage in China near Hong Kong. And elsewhere around the world, there are floods and droughts. And of course, fire continues to devastate communities, particularly in Greece, Spain, Canada, and the Western United States. There's also political unrest and upheaval in lots of places, particularly in Gabon, where there was a military coup overthrowing the government. Mali, Niger, Sudan, Ecuador, and here at home as well as we dig into the coming election cycle with all that that will bring. And of course, war continues in Syria and in Ukraine, as well as the Manipur state of India. It's a lot to take in. To hold in our hearts and minds, and I think it's important to remember that none of it is ours alone to solve. We can't. We aren't any of us Jesus, and that's a really good thing. We need to hold it all, aware of what's going on around the world, and do our part to bring peace, to care for creation, to nurture communities and relationships, and then entrust it all back into God's hands. We need to work together all of us and God on the same side, the side of love and justice for all people and all creation, and to rest and care for ourselves, body, mind, and spirit, so we can do what is ours to do. Please be extra careful if you're out and about this weekend. There will be a lot of traffic and lots of heat. Drink your water, no drinking or dr and driving or boating or riding an ATV. Eat some brats and sweet corn if that's what you enjoy. Try to laugh at least a little. Appreciate the beauty of creation and know that you, yes, you, are an essential part of the world and we need you in it. And remember, it is my deepest honor to be your pastor. And now I invite you to bring yourself to a spirit of worship. Come and remember God's marvelous works. Come and celebrate God's beautiful creation. Come and know God's unfailing love. Come and experience God's incredible grace. Come, come and worship with joy and thanksgiving.
Our first hymn, Praise to the Living God, is a celebration of God's presence with us, a love that will never let us go, that has been with humanity from the beginning and always will be. And let us pray together, remembering the Spirit's presence with us always. Holy God, we are newly aware of your love and care for us. In this time, open us to your Spirit that we might love and care for one another. Give us all we need to follow your call in our lives. Fill us with the courage we need to truly build your community. Guide us that we might work together as one people united in faith and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now we gather in prayer, in heart and mind and spirit, with the faithful throughout the ages and from every corner of the world, trusting in God's promise to be with us, to hear us, to receive the joy and struggle of our lives. Let us pray. Holy One, we come in thanksgiving celebrating your presence with us. We are grateful for friends, family, and all the joys of our lives. We celebrate with all those whose hearts are filled with joy, laughter, and hope this day. We thank you for all the ways you connect us one to another, for the legacy of faith we have inherited, and for the ways you are guiding us and leading us into the future. We thank you for our churches and our parish, 
the connections that they bring to us and all the ways you help us to gather in your name. We give thanks for technology that allows us to reach out across the miles and for the gentleness of the human touch that reminds us of our deep connections to one another. Remind us of your presence in this time and in all we do. Help us that we might truly be your people. Help us to notice and to celebrate the daily miracles, the little glimpses of grace that surround us each day. Guide us that we might look at the world the way you do with eyes and hearts of love. Be with those who stand in harm's way in our name, soldiers, sailors, firefighters, police officers, and first responders. Be with all who provide what we depend on, who are essential to us and to the life of the world, and help us to be grateful and compassionate. We pray particularly in these days, O oh God, for those whose work keeps them outside in sometimes overwhelming conditions to grow and harvest our food, to maintain our roads and communities, to collect our trash, deliver our mail, and drive the trucks that provide the goods we depend on. <clears throat> be with all who work in healthcare in any way and give them the strength they need as they help us with our own and our collective health. Be with our students, teachers, staff, and all their families as a new school year has begun. Guide their hearts and minds that this might be a good and hope-filled year for our learners and their teachers. Be with those in government entrusted with leading our communities and the world and guide their hearts on the path to peace and justice. Be with all who are struggling in body, mind, and spirit. Be with those awaiting surgery and recovering from it. Be with those who have illnesses that are limiting what they can do, and for all who are facing the challenges of aging with dignity. Be with the, those in need of your healing grace, including all who are dealing with COVID as cases are rising in many places. Fill us with your grace and love and help us to know your goodness through all that life brings. Be with those who grieve, the ones with new losses and the ones whose memories make their hearts ache anew. Remind us all of your promise of life everlasting. We pray for the world for all of the places living under the cloud of war and violence, including our own country. And we pray for your peace to fill every part of creation. We pray for Gabon, Mali, Ecuador, Syria, Sudan, and Ukraine, and so many other places where violence and war overwhelms and destroys. We pray for the places dealing with the challenges brought by climate change and extreme weather, and for the healing of this earth you have entrusted to our care. We pray for Florida and Georgia after the hurricane this week, for China and Hong Kong as the typhoon makes landfall, and for all the other places dealing with so much. We continue to pray for those caught in the midst of wildfires, including Hawaii, Canada, the Western US, Greece, and Spain. We pray for all those who are seeking places to live in safety and hope, and all those whose lives are forever changed by the racism, sexism, classism, and the interconnected isms that cause hatred and discrimination. We pray for our communities as we live together with all our different ideas and experiences that we might truly learn how to be one people honoring the dignity of all. Renew our hope, strengthen our faith, deepen our patience and inspire our hearts. Give us all we need for whatever tomorrow holds. Entrusting all our lives to you, we pray with the words that Jesus taught his first disciples saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
We come now to confession, aware that there are places in our lives, in our hearts, that we try to hide from God and from the world and even from our own selves. In humility, we trust in God's goodness that will transform us. Let us pray together. Giving and forgiving God, we come to you to confess the times and places where we have not lived as you taught. We have judged others and overlooked our own faults. We have ignored the suffering around us and taken refuge in the comfort of our own lives. We have hated others and been confident in your love for us. We have allowed divisions and bitterness into our hearts and forgotten your call to be united as one people. Forgive us. Help us to change our ways, to turn our hearts and lives back to you. Help us to be people who share love and work for peace in all we say and do. In faith and hope we pray. Amen. And now in this time of silence, we bring our own personal concerns and struggles to God's love and mercy. Hear the good news. God loves you. God receives you this day in grace and mercy, and in God's love we receive forgiveness and new life through Jesus. Thanks be to God. Our scripture reading today is from the letter to the Romans, to the followers of Jesus living in the capital of the empire, with all the challenges that brings to faithfulness. In this passage, we hear a series of instructions about how to live. Reading from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, adapted from the New Revised Standard Version. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in enthusiasm. Be passionate in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another. Do not be arrogant, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the living of this scripture. I feel like I should start with a confession. It's good for us, right? We just did it. Confessing, unburdening our souls with the things that keep us from our fullest relationship with God and one another. So here goes. I'm not a huge fan of the Apostle Paul and his writings. A lot of the New Testament, more than two-thirds of it is made up of letters he wrote or ones that are attributed to him to the very early churches. There are a few that don't claim Paul as their author and a few we know weren't written by him, but the vast majorities of the letters are his work or are inspired by it. 
Paul was formerly Saul. He was from the family of Benjamin, could trace his heritage in a direct line back to Jacob. And he was raised and educated to be a Pharisee, a devout and faithful Jew who kept the law and enforced the standards of the faith. As a Pharisee, he was one of the people who was opposed to Jesus' ministry, to the things he said and he taught and he did. The Pharisees had built their lives on keeping people out, on defining who was part of the covenant with God and who was excluded. And along comes Jesus inviting everyone in, widening the welcome, making the table of God's grace bigger and bigger and offering seats to the outcasts and the sinners and the unclean and, well, everybody. Saul was one of the most devout and faithful. In the days after Jesus' death and resurrection, he set out to find all the followers of Jesus he could and to bring them back to Jerusalem to stand trial for heresy, for speaking lies against the faith, leading people astray. And then on one of these hunting expeditions, carrying letters of authority to arrest Jesus' disciples from the temple, Saul has a conversion. He falls to the ground blinded by a vision of Jesus. And from that moment on, Saul becomes Paul, changing his name to reflect his change in heart and mind, becoming an incredible evangelist for Jesus, sharing his message far and wide, taking it to the most remote corners of the empire at great risk to himself and his companions. And Paul takes a lot of the same kind of passion and enthusiasm and righteousness into his work on Jesus's behalf that he had brought before to his work as a Pharisee. He's very good at telling people the right way to behave and the right things to do in order to be part of this new movement of Jesus's followers throughout the world. And a lot of what Paul writes seems contradictory. In one letter, he'll praise women speaking up on Jesus' behalf, leading churches in their homes and communities. And in the next letter, he'll caution women to remain quiet and submissive. Paul's got a lot to say about the way that households should be run and encourages escaped slaves to return to their masters and more. And all of that is confusing to us all these many years later because we are in a very different world. Christianity for us has been sort of well established around the world for nearly 1600 years, but for Paul, it was just beginning. The Gospels, for example, hadn't any of them been written yet when Paul was traveling around sharing the story of Jesus's life and ministry. And Paul and everyone he was working with and writing to fully expected Jesus to come back soon, tomorrow, certainly within their own lifetimes. They had to prepare to be ready to not get caught out and unaware when Jesus did return. So Paul writes to keep the peace. In a place where women leading the church didn't cause problems, he encourages them to continue. And in places where it was divisive, he urges them to stop to maintain the unity of the church. The same thing with eating meat and making sacrifices and observing the feasts and festivals. If it was working and not causing problems, fine. If it wasn't and it was keeping people from believing in Jesus, then it needed to stop. My struggle is because Paul is so concerned with keeping the church together for Jesus' immediate return in the end of time that what he writes often seems so contradictory, not in keeping with the actual words of Jesus, the things Jesus says and does in the gospel. But our reading today from Romans is not one of those passages. For me, these words from the 12th chapter sound so much like Jesus. It helps me give Paul a little more grace. These words, exhortations they are called, sound like the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, like so many of the teaching of Jesus to the people by the Sea of Galilee, so much of how he asked his first disciples and that great crowd that follows him to behave in their daily lives. An exhortation is something said strongly, 
with passion and enthusiasm meant to advise the listener, to give them courage, to strengthen them to do the right thing. And in this passage, Paul is giving a list of exhortations, things that his first audience and us all these years later should be doing if we're really going to follow Jesus, if we're going to be his disciples, to form a community based on the way he lived when he walked this earth. The list is anchored in love. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. That's it. If we could master that part, get it to be rooted in us in the deepest parts of our bodies and souls, if we could live it out in our every interaction with others and our every thought about ourselves, it would, I think, utterly change the world. If love became not how we behave, but who we are, became our very essence, the world would change. Maybe not in an instant, probably not in an instant, but it would surely change if we looked at others and we interacted with them and thought, how can I love in this situation? It would just be remarkable. And Paul goes on to give even more exhortations, instructions about how to live out this love in the world. Care for the saints, extend hospitality, persevere in prayer, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, do not be arrogant, associate with the lowly, do not repay evil for evil, never avenge yourselves, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Depending on how you divide up the list and how you count, there are about 28 of these exhortations, ways that Paul is encouraging the followers of Jesus to behave, to live in this world while trying to create a better world. And that, after all, is the point of exhortation, to inspire the hearers and the listeners to become doers, to live a different way in the world so that a different world can be born. And none of the things on this list come particularly naturally to us. Sure, it's easy to love some people, at least some of the time, but weeping with those who weep, who wants to do that? And feeding our enemies, no thank you. And blessing those who persecute us and leaving vengeance to God, nah, It's much easier to want to take all that into our own hands and lash out at those we believe have wronged us. Maybe that's why this passage of all of Paul's writings is less difficult for me to wrap my head around because it sounds so much like Jesus. It's honest about the fact that nearly everything Jesus asks us to do as his disciples is not part of human nature. Jesus is constantly asking us to do things that resist selfishness and self-interest, to build up community and connection instead of individualism and independence, things that honor how much we have in common instead of all of our perceived differences. Jesus in so much of the Gospels and Paul in this passage from Romans are asking us to come as we are, full of all of our humanity and become who God knows we can be, created in the image and likeness of God. They're exhorting us, inviting us, praying for us to find a way forward that honors the goodness of our own lives and of every other person on this planet, all of us beloved children of the same God. They're pleading with us, asking us, hoping we will see our unity and our dependence on one another and that we have a choice. We can continue the way humanity has lived, selfishly pretending we are independent and trying to rely on our own ways, or we could choose a new way, a new path that remembers we are connected, dependent on God and on one another for our very lives. So today, I exhort you, I plead, I pray we might all hear Jesus in these words of Paul, hear a clear call for our lives as individuals 
and as a community of Jesus' faithful people to live our best lives, the fullest expression of who we are and whose we are, holding fast to what is good and living all things in genuine love. Amen. Our hymn, Won't You Let Me Be Your Servant, is a prayer that our mutual life, about our mutual life together, that we might be servants to others and let others serve us, growing together in the life of faith. And now I invite you to gather your communion elements near you. In response to God's grace, the United Church of Christ and our parish practice open communion. Gathered or scattered at one table or many, we are all God's children, sharing in the abundant grace and love made known to us in Jesus. Without exception, all are truly welcome to share at this table. We come to this table to remember all the meals Jesus shared during his lifetime, breaking bread and knowing that God is present every time we gather at the table, no matter how simple. We come with all of who we are and might yet become, trusting in the goodness of God's grace and love revealed in this table today. We come to experience God's grace, to support those who are struggling, to celebrate with those who are rejoicing, to walk with those who have questions, to sit with those who are lonely, and to stand with those who are oppressed until the fullness of God's kingdom comes for all people and all creation. We come to declare that this table spread by our community is a place of welcome for all and is open to everyone without exception. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for giving yourself to us in Jesus, to live among us and to know our lives. We pray you might feed us and strengthen us at this table, that we might truly follow in his footsteps. Amen. We remember all the meals Jesus shared, resisting the violence, divisions, and injustice of society, and working to create a community of true and abundant welcome. 
We remember when more than 5,000 people gathered to hear Jesus and he fed them with five loaves of bread and two small fish, everyone eating until they were full and there still being enough left over to fill 12 baskets. We remember when Jesus ate with the tax collector Levi, an outcast in his community because he worked for the Roman Empire, and how Jesus welcomed him, inviting him to embrace new life. We remember Jesus sharing a cup of water with a Samaritan woman, a foreigner and a stranger, and Jesus sitting down at the table with Pharisees, the religious and social leaders of his day. And we remember when all hope seemed lost, buried in the tomb, Jesus appeared to his disciples on the road to Emmaus, telling the story of our faith, breaking bread together, and sharing again in the mystery of communion. We pray that this bread, given for life and love, and this cup, given for mercy and hope, might be a blessing to us today as we work to follow Jesus. Come, come and know how good God is. Amen. Please, partake of your communion elements now. And now, having shared together in worship, let us pray in thanksgiving for all God has done in us and for us. God of life, we thank you for all our blessings and for the gift of this time together as your people. Guide us as we live into this week that we might share your love with everyone we meet. Bless the gifts we have brought and multiply the good that they can do for your kingdom here on earth. Inspire our parish that we might continue our work of becoming a place of welcome, love, and hope for all people and all creation. In Christ we pray. Amen.
Our last hymn, Go My Children With My Blessing, is a reminder that wherever we go, whatever we do in this life, we go surrounded by God's love. And now, my friends, receive this benediction. May the grace of God, the love of Jesus, and the presence of the Holy Spirit bring you hope and peace today and always. Amen.